Amen. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, just an amazing opportunity to dive into scripture. And we've had a great time so far. We've heard from so many uh, across and we're loving reading what you're putting in the chat as well. Thank you for that. But now I'm really, really excited uh, to welcome our kind of keynote speaker for the evening and for the weekend, in, in fact, uh, Shane Claiborne. He's uh, a prominent speaker, an activist. He's a best-selling author. Some of his books include uh, Jesus for President, uh, Red Letter Revolution, Follow Me to Prayer, uh, Jesus Bombs and Ice Cream, which I've not read, but I'm already captivated by the title. Um, Executing Grace and his classic, which was actually the first book I ever read as a Christian, other than the Bible, of course, uh, The Ir Irresistible Revolution. Um, and then, of course, his latest book as well, which is Beating Guns. Uh, Shane's worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, and, and he founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia, um, which he, and he also heads up the Red Letter Christians, which is a movement of folk which are essentially committed to living as if Jesus means the things that he said. Uh, it's none other than Shane. We're delighted to have you here with us live. Um, hello. How are you, Shane? I'm doing, I'm doing great. great. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. I've been uh, worshiping, worshiping with, with you and tuning, tuning in, in for the last, the last hour. hour. I'm excited I'm to be a part of the, the, the whole weekend. weekend. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. Uh, just starting off, obviously, you're coming in live from home. W what time is it where you're, where you're at right now? Uh, we're, we're right we're at three right o'clock in the afternoon. In the afternoon. I'm, uh, I've been in Philly for 25 years, but right now we're spending some good quality time with our family down in North Carolina and Tennessee, hence my charming Southern accent. So that's where I am right now. Amazing. Shane, what, what has your 2020 been like? I'm sure you'll tell us more later, so no spoilers, but, um, but yeah, what's it been like for you? Well, like you all, I heard so many of those powerful stories uh, in the, the videos and the, the stories that you just had. And for us, it's been one of those uh, uh, times where you, you try to see what the Spirit's going to do in the midst of a really chaotic time. And uh, I am just stunned by how the community I'm a part of in Philadelphia has risen up to show love and compassion in the middle of the pandemic. We've been a COVID testing site where hundreds of folks uh, have come to be tested and uh, many of them don't have homes, uh, many of them live on the streets. And so it's a really precious time to try to show some hospitality uh, and to keep people safe. And um, we've been delivering food bags to senior citizens and uh, all of this led by by folks I've been doing life with in, in Philly for the last couple of decades. And Katie and I have been, uh, we, we were already planning on doing this. We just celebrated 25 years in Philly and 10 years of being married together. So we've got this school bus that's converted into a solar powered tiny house. <laughs> So we're living off of that, hanging out with our family. I'm not on the bus right now, but it's uh, not far away. That is amazing. I mean, first of all, congratulations on the anniversary. Yes, that's definitely. big. That's awesome. But uh, I, I'm going to love to hear at some point more about the, the, the converted bus as well. Solar power bus. That's amazing. Um, but, but the truth is you're going to unpack some scripture for us and share your thoughts with us now. So before you do that, I'm just going to pray for you and then throw over to you if that's all right. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to connect with Shane. Uh, we thank you that because of technology, we're able to connect so easily. Lord, I just pray that right now by your spirit, you would speak through Shane, that the words that he speaks would encourage us, challenge us, that they would come straight from you. God, we pray that as, as your people, we would be challenged by what you have for us tonight. But that also, Lord, we would be encouraged Encouraged to go live the life that you've called us to live as your children, as brothers and sisters. But I pray that you would anoint his lips right now as he speaks to us. Open our ears that we would clearly hear you and open our eyes that we would clearly see you. In Jesus' precious and awesome name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Shane, over to you. Well, thanks. And, and it's just a privilege and a delight to get to share with all of you. Uh, I, I want to get right back to this text that we read in just a second, but I, I feel like I need to put all my cards on the table and just say that I'm not officially Baptist. <laughs> But so many of my my, my uh, grandparents, my ancestors were, and my friend Tony Campolo, as some of you know, is my he's been my uh, 
partner in ministry and holy mischief for 20 some years. And uh, Tony always says, you know, you might not have to be Baptist to get into heaven, but why take a chance? <laughs> so he's he's uh, been uh, that Baptist voice in my ear for so long. And I, I grew up uh, going, you know, to the Baptist church, some of my grandparents, I grew up um, really in the Methodist church. And then I got involved in the Pentecostal movement. I really became intrigued by the Anna, Anabaptists and, and uh, you know, more recently have been mentored by Catholics and worked with Mother Teresa. So all of that has shaped me. And one of the things that I find very consistent as I look at the, the big body of Christ is that we have been really good at promising people life after death and not always as good at looking at the world that we live in right now and saying, how does our faith impact the world that we're living in? Um, and I, I'm convinced that this isn't an either or. You know, I'm excited about life after death. And I always uh, tell our community, we'll party like there's no tomorrow and there won't be. Uh, but at the end of the day, Jesus did not just come to prepare us to die, but teach us, but to teach us how to live and how to love right now. And part of why I think we're losing a lot of young people in the church is because we're promising them life after death when they're asking, is there life before death? You know, doesn't the gospel have relevancy to the broken world that we're living in right now? Doesn't the gospel address uh, the environmental crisis and racial justice? And so I think that's where we have an opportunity to shine right now, you know, to, to really say that this gospel that we read, uh, has everything to do with the transformation of this world, right? That the kingdom of God Jesus talked about was not just something we're going to go up to when we die, but something we're to usher in while we live, like we're to bring on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so I love this scripture and I, I, I want to jump back into it where it, it's, it's such a beautiful text. It's been uh, really formative for us in our work in Philadelphia. Uh, and it's a, it, I think it's a pretty scandalous text. And I love the reading that we heard of it, you know, that this man comes, a, you know, an expert in the law and he comes to test Jesus, which is never a good idea, right? And, and so as he's interacting with Jesus, he asks this question, who is my neighbor? And I also think that is always uh, a tricky question because anyone who's asking who is my neighbor is also implying who is not my neighbor, <laughs> right? Who is exempt from my love and compassion? Who, who do I not have to care for? And so Jesus's answer is just brilliant, right? When he tells the story that we often know as the Good Samaritan, uh, but there's a few things that I want to pull out of this story. And one of them is that a friend of mine said, this story uh, would have never happened if people were not walking down the street where people get beat up. And it occurs to me that uh, we're very good at moving away from the places where people get beat up. So much of the momentum and the, the the forces of this world are compelling us to move out of neighborhoods where there's high crime or there's people who don't look like us. And yet the gravity of the gospel calls us not away from the pain, but towards the pain of the world. And uh, there's a song and uh, Derek Webb, I think it was that wrote this song. Uh, and one of the lines of it is, life has been good, I've finally been able to move out of Jesus's neighborhood. <laughs> and it kind of names the irony that, that, that much of the church and many of us Christians have been good at moving away from the neighborhoods that are just like the neighborhoods that Jesus would be moving into. Uh, as we think of Nazareth, that, you know, it, they said nothing good could come from there. So this story begins with people walking down a road 
where people get beat up. It also reminds me that um, people get beat up at very inconvenient times, <laughs> right? You look at this story and all of these people, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, I'm sure they all had plans for their day. And yet they, there was an interruption. Someone else's crisis interrupted their routine. And it occurs to me that this is a pattern in Scripture that it, half the Gospels are written in the middle of an interruption. Right. You think about it. Jesus is on his way somewhere and someone pulls on his, uh, you know, on his cloak and says, can you help me out? Or my daughter is sick. Can you come to my house? Or we just ran out of wine at our wedding. Can you help a brother out? You know, like he's, he's constantly interrupted. And yet. Many of us have very little room for that holy space. To be interrupted. So it's an invitation to kind of allow our journey in life to be interrupted by someone else's suffering, by someone else's pain. Even in this pandemic, we many of us have had to recalculate and rethink our lives. And maybe it's in that sacred space that is unfamiliar, that was unpredictable, that wasn't in our daytimer, that the magic happens. So let's leave space for interruptions. And, and this has certainly been a year of interruption. Uh, the, the other obvious part of this story that is so scandalous is that the people who should be the heroes of the story are not. Uh, and the person who would be the most unlikely hero uh, becomes the person that is this exemplary model of, of compassion. So you, you think of the, the priest and the Levite. I mean, these were archetypal religious people, right? These were the icons of uh, the, the religious order of the day. And yet they pass by on the other side. I used to give them a pretty hard time and say that they must have been really late to the trustee meeting at church. Um, but one of my friends said, maybe we shouldn't be so hard on them. Maybe they were just scared. You know, th th there's literally an injured person in the ditch and these bandits could still be around. Maybe they were just concerned for themselves and didn't want to stop because of what might happen to them. And yet Martin Luther King said that the religious people might have been concerned at what would happen to them if they stopped. But the Samaritan was concerned at what would happen to the person in the ditch if they did not stop. And so the Samaritan, right, the Samaritan is the surprising hero of the story, the scandalous hero, because the Samaritans. They were ostracized, shunned in so many ways for numbers for a number of reasons. One is that they, according to you know Orthodox Jews, they didn't have all the good theology. They had some uh, differing views on where you worshipped and how you worshipped. They were also an interracial group of people. So they were ostracized because of the mis mixing of ethnicities. And so uh, for these reasons, they were shunned. And yet this makes it all the more beautiful that the Samaritan is the one who steps up. And he may not have had his theology right, but he had his compassion right. And I know we're in a virtual little thing here, but you can still say amen, right? And the folks who had their theology right, did not have the compassion right. And in the end, love is the litmus test, right? If our theology does not manifest itself in concrete acts of love and compassion, then maybe God has not transformed our entire beings into who God wants us to be. And I think this is a, a, a pattern in Scripture, right? That Sister Joan Chittister uh, so wonderfully says that we see a pattern in Jesus' life and teaching that God is constantly challenging the chosen and including the excluded. 
So the people that thought they had the corner on the market of religion are often the ones who are challenged. And the people who were on the fringes of the faith or even ostracized by the religious community were the people that Jesus often celebrates the work of God happening through. So that's the scandal of the story, right? I mean, you think of Jesus' harshest words, like brood of vipers. They, he didn't use that language to the folks on the fringes of the faith, but the people who were at the center of the religious elite, he says to them, you are a brood of vipers because your religion is oppressive. It puts heavy burdens on people. It's not life-giving and liberating. And he says to those religious people, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you. <laughs> I, kind of, I kind of think like that's that ruffles some feathers. That gets you in a little trouble. Like saying that the very people that you've excluded are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. So this is the scandalous gospel of Jesus, right? That, that we see in this story. And I, I want to say that that as we think of the person in the ditch, we don't know much about them. Scholars say that the two main ways that you could identify the person in the ditch have been taken away from them. And that was their language and their uh, clothing, their attire. The, the, the person is left unconscious, as the scripture said. So we can't tell from their language or their dialect or their accent where they're from. Uh, the other thing is there by what they were wearing, we might be able to tell uh, where they were from or something of their religion or their region. We don't know any of that because they're stripped naked and left unconscious. And so maybe that's part of the point of the story, right? All that we know about the person in the ditch is that they are a child of God, made in the image of God. And that's all that matters when it comes to asking, who is my neighbor? Whoever is in that ditch is my neighbor. We don't know what their religion is, what their language is. We don't even know their sexual orientation. All that we know is that they are a child of of God made in the image of God. Their life matters. And I, I think one of the things that has happened in our country, even in the pandemic, is that we, um, we've seen that injustice, inequity, has to have a name in a face. And in the midst of the pandemic, you know, we've had uh, this reckoning around racial justice happening in our country. And the Black Lives Matter movement has put names and faces on injustice. Uh, on so many of the marches that we go on, one of the, the things that we say together is we say her name. Brianna Taylor, say his name, George Floyd, Freddie Gray, Ahmaud Arbery, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown. We're saying their names. And so maybe a part of why the person in the ditch doesn't have a name is that we are to name that person in our own lives, in our own communities. Uh, we are to make injustice personal. I'm convinced one of the challenges in the church, one of the greatest challenges, is not just a compassion problem, but a proximity problem. That sometimes we're not close enough to the pain so that it becomes personal, right? And there's something about what happens in Jesus that is all about a God who becomes proximate. A God who leaves all the comfort of heaven and comes to us as a brown-skinned, Palestinian, Jewish, refugee born in a manger because there was no room in the end, executed on the cross. Everything in the life of Jesus is about 
a God who is leaning in to the suffering of the world and making that suffering personal. I know for me, part of what has put the fire in my bones around the different issues of injustice is that proximity. I mean, you know, for, for part of what we've really been doing uh, uh, recently is trying to address gun violence in our country. Many of you all have a lot of knife violence or you have other manifestations of racism or hatred or violence. But one of the the monsters, uh, the principalities and powers in our country is gun violence. And we, we even in the pandemic, saw record numbers of gun deaths, 41,000 lives lost during the pandemic. The highest rates of gun violence that we've seen in uh, decades. And yet it doesn't become urgent until it becomes personal. And what happened for me um, is living in North Philadelphia where we live. Interestingly, my neighborhood's called Kensington, but it's very different from the Kensington over there. <laughs> And my neighborhood, I love it. There's so many things I love about my neighborhood, but we are really struggle from the gun violence. And uh, we had almost 500 deaths in Philadelphia, many of them in Kensington last year. But what happened is that became personal. There was a young man who was killed on my front steps and he was still alive when I found him. I heard the gunshots. I came out, I held his hand and uh, prayed with him. And then he died the next morning. And it was after Papito died, 19 years old, that this issue became so personal. And we began to organize around gun violence. We began to get guns off of our streets. And as some of you all know, one of the things we've been doing is transforming guns into garden tools uh, based off of the verses from Isaiah and Micah, where they say God's people will beat swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks. And so we've been taking donated guns from all over Philadelphia and all over the country and transforming them into garden tools. So this is a, a little shovel that's made out of a the barrel of a gun. And even this uh, wood is made from the wood stock of the gun. This plow is made uh, out of uh, a gun that's been transformed. Sometimes I tell people this is what a born again gun looks like, right? All things can be made new. And we make these little necklaces that we crush out of the a little slice of the barrel and we turn them into hearts that we give to victims of gun violence. But this is holy work of transformation, right? And it reminds me of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King as he reflected on the story that we just read of the Good Samaritan. Dr. King said, we're all called to be the Good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch on the road to Jericho. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say, maybe we need to reimagine the whole road to Jericho. Maybe we need to do something about why people keep landing in the ditch to begin with. So this work of compassion also leads us to justice, right? The holy prophetic work of reimagining the world. And, and I think that's one of the central calls of this story and our vocation uh, as a church is to not accept the world as it is, but to insist on building the world as it should be. To build a world where we seek the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And one way of thinking about that is, what would it look like if God's dream, God's dream came on earth, in my neighborhood, on my block, in my city, in my country? What is God's dream for our world right now? And as we seek that, the 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 world can see that Christians are not just using our faith as a ticket into heaven and a license and excuse to ignore 
the suffering of this world, but our faith actually fuels us to care about the folks in the ditch and to care about transforming the streets so that people don't keep landing in the ditch. Our faith has as much to do about this life as it does with the next. And I want to win souls and see hearts transformed. I think that's part of the holy work God is doing. But I also believe in a God, right? We believe in a God that is transforming this world. And we know, as Corinthians says, that we can have faith to move mountains and speak in tongues of men and of angels, and do all sorts of miracles and prophecies and fathom all the depths of knowledge. But if we have not love, it's still empty. So the, in the end, what really matters is that our worship of God, our theology transforms us into people who respond to the suffering and the holy interruptions of the pain of this world. So that's my prayer for you, my brothers and sisters. I am so honored to get to listen to the stories and to speak into your own story as the Baptist Assembly, you know, as you meet this weekend. And I, I want to invite us today to make a fresh commitment to lean into the suffering of the world, to recommit ourselves to walk the streets where people get beat up, to allow our schedules to be interrupted by the pain and the crises of those around us. And let us stir our imagination that we might reimagine the world not for just as it is now, but for how God wants it to be. So let me pray for you all. And I look forward to being with you uh, again tomorrow. We're going to have an open conversation together. I'll be listening in as your other uh, speakers share. And as you worship God together, I'm praying for you as you meet. And let me pray for you now. Dear God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters my family on the other side of the pond there, that as they meet and they listen to you and as they worship you, I pray that you would speak to them, speak to us in new ways, stir our minds and our imaginations. Forgive us when we have been the religious folks who pass by on the other side. And forgive us when we might think that someone else who doesn't share our theology or who might look different from us or be from a different place than we live, that you might not use them. Forgive us if we've ever thought that, oh God. Surprise us with the scandal of your grace. Thank you for your word and how it speaks to us today. And we do pray, as you taught us, Jesus, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. Amen.